Welcome back to our debate on climate change. In the first part of the programme, we discussed the failure of Copenhagen, and now we're going to take a look ahead to the Climate Change Conference in Cancun in Mexico. We're being told that the greed economy promises jobs and perhaps new industry and growth in the future. Commissioner Hedegaard, the smart car company reckons that this new electric car that they're producing won't create a single extra job. Are we again guilty of trying to get hopes up too high? No, I don't think so. I think that a lot of efforts have been put into trying to manage expectations for Cancun because you can do a thing like Copenhagen once and then you mobilize world opinion and that's fine, but then you will have to do it differently the next time. And I think we can have a balanced package on adaptation and forestry and technology on the finance part, some of it, the fast start finance, of course. And I think that we could also do make progress in carbon markets and how to get transparency You, in the you whole really thing. think it is going to generate new jobs? Because some people are very doubtful about that. I believe that the jobs that we have to get for the future will have to be greener jobs than the jobs we had before. I think that we cannot, in a world where when my children will be my age, will be 9 billion people on planet Earth instead of now 6.7 billion, all of them wanting a share in the good life, then we simply have to become much more energy efficient and much more resource efficient. It's not just whether we think that would be nice to have, that is need to have. Roger Helmer, I think I saw you jump. <laughs> well, indeed, uh, the experience, I mean, let's look at the experience, not the vague promises. The experience is that green jobs are short-lived, that green jobs uh, result in jobs being lost elsewhere in the economy. Many green jobs are abroad. We're, we're, we're offering fantastic subsidies on photovoltaic systems, um, but the photovoltaic systems frequently are made in China or elsewhere outside the EU. We've seen uh, wind farm factory, wind turbine factories closing down for lack of demand. So on the one hand, we're talking about a wonderful future for wind. On the other hand, many member states are pulling back from wind investment and companies making wind equipment uh, are suffering. The problem that we face is with a, a technology like wind, it delivers an intermittent trickle of very expensive electricity. If it gets over a threshold level of about 4 or 5% in the system, then the grid starts to become very difficult difficult to manage and eventually I have to say, un it is, unmanageable. It is simply not true. Well, if it you is, go, I mean, I come from a country, Denmark, where we have 28% of all e electricity coming from wind. And you export most of it free no, to Sweden. No, that's our own consumption. It's just to say that it depends on whether you have a good grid system. And that was the point Corinne was making. Yeah. And you have the highest so, electricity I mean, bills in Europe. I mean, you can, Europe. of course, preach that we should do nothing different than we did in the past. I'm not preaching I, that at I all. Will, no, I'm just, saying that wind is bad. That's not saying that say, nothing new is good. If we do that, then we will definitely lose a lot of jobs because all our mm. old manufacturing mm. things, all mm. industrial production mm. has moved out a well, long time ago. So we have to find out yeah. what is the yeah. future jobs. Of we the will lose jobs in the UK. And I will tell you why, because we will be facing blackouts by 2015 because our government is committed to 30% of our electricity generation from wind by 2020. Everybody knows it's physically not possible. Everybody knows the grid can't be balanced. All the industry experts, chief executives of major energy companies are saying we're facing a real danger of blackouts by the middle of this decade. That will I, do nothing for jobs. Well, now you're in government. Now you're in government. Uh, well, do something about it. What, what is what is Dems running the energy yeah, policy? What, what, what is uh, I think Coalition the smart part? The Indeed. smart part of the European policy is that the the percentage of renewable that's European that's a target we all have to meet. But uh, what a kind of renewables? That's up to the member states, and I think that is really that helps to make the most effective choices. When Great Britain doesn't make the, the most effective choices, please change it uh, in your country. What about and, nuclear? Why can't and, we use nuclear if you want low you carbon? Can do that as much as you and but it doesn't count towards our renewable target. Europe Why not? says nothing about what, whether you can that or not. No, Europe should include That's nuclear British. as if, low carbon. If you look at historical uh, record uh, on the link between economy and, and price of energy, you see, for example, Russia, for almost always they have had cheap uh, energy. Has that uh, created... Uh, 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 booming economy in Russia. No, they, they, they are well. only booming when the oil price is high because they, they export oil. But they have enormous energy wasting. Cheap energy prices lead to wasting of energy inefficiency of economy, inefficiency of resource use. That's not an intelligent strategy for, for any country. 
Well, let's talk now about the weight of uh, developing, developing countries in Cancun. And let's ask Mohamed Al Hadrami in New York. Uh, Mr. Hadrami, um, is the group of 77 ready at all for Cancun? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Yes, we are. We, we actually, uh, for the proposed package that was proposed in Tianjin in our last talks, we expressed our views that we are ready to uh, a successful Cancun. Whatever we do in Cancun should not in any way compromise or prejudge the objective of reaching a legally binding outcome in the future. We agree that maybe it's, it's a bit really uh, not there that we could actually achieve a legally binding in Cancun, but whatever we do there should not compromise that objective in the future. And for that to happen, I think we need to focus on a roadmap that we could agree to in Cancun so it would lead us or to lead the process for us uh, to advance forward, not like what happened in Copenhagen. We have a representative of Business Europe here with us in the studio. That's uh, Martin Westrup. And uh, you, you have a question for the Commissioner on international carbon trading. Yes, exactly. Um, I, um, I would like to continue to um, focus on the uh, international aspects of climate change. And um, as climate change is a global problem, it only has global solutions, as we are um, all aware. And one of the more cost-effective ways of addressing climate change on the, uh, on the global scale uh, would be um, international carbon markets. And I would like to ask the uh, Commissioner Hedegaard in particular, but also the other panelists, what uh, you're willing to uh, propose as concrete uh, suggestions in Cancun on this matter. I would say that our whole policy, as I know that you will agree, it has been to try to secure that we could have a global level playing field. That's the whole idea behind the UN negotiations, else it would have been much easier to give them up a long time ago. So that's the whole purpose. And in Cancun, we will try to uh, suggest different uh, improvements of the carbon market. For instance, the way the CDM market works. Today, we have a lot of clean development mechanism projects in the emerging economies, the relatively rich developing countries, and 90 some percent of the projects go to them. We would rather like to use that kind of money with them for more sectoral approaches, work with China and India and Brazil in that way, and then modernize and make it a bit more simple to have projects in the least developed countries, in the poorer countries. So in that way, we could modernize the international and global carbon market. What I think is important is what the Commissioner said, is that we have to take care of the global competitiveness. So when we can uh, have an emission trading system on a, uh, on a global level, it's excellent. But also other kinds of approaches, sectoral approaches uh, for some countries. To, so to, to also look into the good achievements in other parts of the world. Uh, for instance, the investments in research and development in the United States, the way they organize this, there, there we can learn from. So, but when we take the global competitiveness also, and so not only what we want to achieve, but also the global competitiveness in, uh, in, in our approach and not only having our European ideas and, and, and trying to, to sell that to the world, I think then we can really make progress also for our businesses. You can't expect a global cap and trade mechanism because the States isn't going to buy it, India isn't going to buy it, um, China isn't going to buy it. It's not going to happen. Um, we are going to crucify ourselves. Of, what is the role of European business in that? I was really shocked for, uh, of the news that big European companies are giving a have given election campaign funding for uh, those ones in, in US Congress who have been blocking the climate legislation. European companies like BP, ArcelorMittal, BASF, Solvay, E.ON, for example, they have given funding for those ones who fight against the US climate legislation. Here they are preaching of global solutions and level playing field. And in US, they are doing their best to not get a, a global deal, to not get a well, climate legislation th in thank USA. Thank God our industrialists have more sense than our politicians would be my no, answer. But can but I say it's, that it's our, not honest. Our industrialists have actually been very happy with the CDM. And I think that could be confirmed by Business Europe also. Because basically, that is sound logic. Instead of making some very, very expensive cuts in Europe, then some of the cuts we were going to make could go into new technologies in developing countries. Is that, not, is that not a sensible way? Because that's a way that they get some of the new technologies, some of the energy efficient technologies, and our businesses will pave their way into new mar markets. I so I think it's a pity that you just, without 
obviously, without sort of knowing a lot of these projects, I've seen some of them. Some of them are actually very, very good, and they um, are transferring I, technology. We, we, well, that's all we have time um, for now. Um, will Cancun surprise us all and produce a result, or will it be marked down as another failure on the road to South Africa? <laughs> well, we'll find out very soon, I suppose. Meanwhile, I'd like to thank Commissioner Connie Hedegaard and uh, our MEPs, Corinne Wartman Cole, Sadhu Hassi, and of course, Roger Helmer. And we mustn't forget Mohammed Al Hadrani in New York, too. Thanks, too, to our studio audience and to you at home for joining us. From Brussels, from both of us, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>